Hello and welcome to Web of Light. I'm Dr. Kevin and this month's uh, guest co-host, if you've been following along, is none other than Matt Connerton. I hope they've been following along, Dr. Kevin. Well, if they're not, then it's your fault. You've been driving them away. Fine. <laughs> Be I mean, that way. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. Whatever, man. Uh, Matt Connerton is a, a long-standing friend of the Web of Light show, the Dr. Kevin show, uh, and is the uh, founder of IPM Nation. Yes, indeed. Uh, which which actually hosts the Dr. Kevin and Friends uh, TV channel. TV channel. Yes. 24 hours a day, seven days a week of Dr. Kevin. Yes. I was gonna, that's more than I can take. Um, <laughs> You've never quite thought of it uh, that way, have you? Yeah. Wait a yeah. minute. That's... That's 24 hours, that's seven like days being, a week of that's, me. That's, that's like, well, it's me and friends. <laughs> that, to be fair, yes, there are friends of yours there, too. It's not just you. Yeah, there's yeah. all sorts of friends, and yes. there's almost 30 years of, of uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, Matt has a Matt Connerton, in, uh, Matt Connerton Unleashed in the afternoon, which is a drive-by shooting show, drive-time show. Yeah, we don't drive by, drive through. Drive time. Yeah, drive we don't through. we don't encourage uh, drive by shootings. They uh, they cause my audience to diminish because then people are dead. Well, there are other kinds of drive by shootings, Matt, and I there have are. been as a I have been <laughs> as a guest on your show numerous times. Actually, it's almost like I'm a I'm a, I'm a semi regular kind of on your radio show. Oh, you're yeah, you're not a guest. You're you're what we call a friend of the show, I'm a which is an elevated status. It's yes. See, but with this, you have other friends of the show that I've seen definitely do drive-by shootings, which means they show up unannounced, come in, talk a lot, and then the minute you try to engage them in conversation or you would want to say something back to them, then they have to leave. I call that a drive-by shooting. I see what you mean. Yes, they, they come on and they filibuster. Yes, they yes. come on and they filibuster. Yes. And they fill a mat and they fill an hour and they fill whatever you let them, unless you duct tape them. Sometimes they get really upset. Uh, the uh, show from uh, when would uh, what would the date be? Last oh February second. If you go to wmnhradio.org and download February second of Matt Connerton Unleashed, you can hear John Hopwood filled with rage. Oh my! You've guessed hosted his show a couple of times. Yes, I have. Queen but, City Chronicles. Yes, but you can hear him February second. Check it out, especially huh? second hour. He becomes he becomes unleashed. Oh my. Oh, he was beat red and everything. It was great. Oh. Great radio. But he was legitimately very angry. Yeah. I, we won't go into it. <laughs> so, you know, um, and you've been, you've been carrying the Dr. Kevin show in a simulcast for all 13 years. Because I'm, in I'm into my 13th year. Wow. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Yeah, the, for the radio show, which right now is on OM Times, but you're there the first of every month. Mm hmm. And. Some people come and go, and you never see them again. And then some people, like a bad penny, keep returning. That's right. We have a bad penny as a guest today. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, we have Kyle Russell from Crystal Concentrics. Now, this is your first time being on the show with Kyle. Yes. But Kyle was on back when Angie was my co-host. Uh, because he was at last year's Web of Light Expo. He's going to be back at this year's Web of Light Expo. Uh, we also, was a show we did in uh, March, I think, and we did some uh, uh, mini taping there and interviewed Kyle and mm. did some stuff out there. Uh, Kyle um, has been doing crystals. Uh, well, let me see. If he'd been doing crystals as long as crystals have been going on, that means he'd be Mel Brooks, the oldest man in the world. Pretty much. Oh, wow. Pretty much. Kyle, welcome. <laughs> hey. <laughs> welcome. How would you like that introduction? I thought it was, uh, it was interesting as usual. I know I can always count on you for a colorful introduction. And quite verbose. Yes. <laughs> so um, you uh, are one of our crystal experts that come on. We have a couple of them, you know, and people have some very different and some very similar things to say at times. Um, the, the crystal community, uh, especially crystal, crystal dealers and teachers and stuff like this, is a, is a world unto itself. True. True. Um, but you, uh, you, know, you were on about 11 months ago. We had you on the show. 
um, going into the last Web of Light Expo. You've had a lot of changes. There are a lot of things up, and there's a lot of things going on in the crystal world. And so before you dive into those, though, for Christmas, I got this. My husband got me a Hyperson. I had actually not heard of a Hyperson yet. Mm. I, I don't know if the camera can actually pick it up very much or not. It's fascinating. It's one of the dark stones. It's got a little reflective stuff. Um, but I would love your take on what is this stone? When would, when would you recommend somebody wear it? And uh, what, uh, what's the magic? What's the magical mm. properties? Oh, Wizard Russell. <clears throat> I like the question, and I like the stone a lot. I actually only ever discovered that stone about one or two years ago. I hadn't ever seen it before. And for those who weren't able to tune into it so close up, it's, it, it seemed, it's black, but it also has a funny way of playing with light. Um, I consider it a little bit of a cross between a Labradorite and a Tiger Eye or rather a hawk's eye, because hawk's eye is the blue or black version of tiger eye. And as such, it shares qualities with both of those other stones. Um, any stone that has flash or plays with light is what I call a vision stone. So it has to do with creativity, imagination, and when it's dark, it tends to take it into a sort of behind the scenes, more subconscious place. Mm. So it's not all very surfacey. And so I think of the, the I've seen it uh, pronounced hypersthene because the spelling is so completely ridiculous. It's one of those mm. many, many stones that has utterly uh, unsexy names, I think. <laughs> I, think the, I think the way you said it was way, way better than I've, I've heard it said. Do you think the way he said it was sexy? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I think it tended more towards the sexy side of he the He likes that kind of compliment, don't you, I'm Dr. Sure Kevin? he does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and there's another really awful name for a stone called Stillbite. Oh, that is Still awful. Bite does yeah. nothing for anyone. <laughs> um, and it's a beautiful stone. It's a peach-colored Indian stone that crystallizes in a very unique way and shows up next to apophyllite. So it's weird that sometimes these stones that have incredible qualities get kind of a short shrift because they've been given dumb names. I actually played in a death metal band called Still Bite. Oh, a lot of people don't know that about me. As well you should. Yes, well, yes. <laughs> well, you know, and the funny thing is, is, it, is crystals are no different than children. You can have a very bright child with a very bad name that they yes. get stuck with and traumatized mm. in school. That's true. I mean, I, I, whoever named Still Bite, I think should pay the therapy bill from Still Bite <laughs> to come so that I can do some therapy with them. <laughs> exactly right. Do some, well, you know, right. do some, you know, spiritual coaching and counseling. Right. Some healing is needed there. Now, on <laughs> the other hand, um, you know, people that are, you know, into, you know, bondage or S&M, they might like Still Bite, stand still, I'll bite you. There you, know, you go. That, so. uh -huh. I hadn't thought of that, but I'm glad it was you who brought that up. <laughs> Uh, are you really? Are you really glad it was him that brought it up? Yeah, better than me. Okay, well, right. someone had to. Right, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> I suppose. You know what it is. So, um, so creativity. Creativity, um, imagination, the dark side, the inner, uh, the inner circle. Um, what do they call it? The shadow side. The shadow. The well, you see, side. so I have no imagination, no creativity, and no shadow side, so I guess I, I, I don't it's know what It's not meant for you. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Anybody watching this show would know how true that is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you got all those things, and all those things are going on right there in the stone. Yeah, I really liked it. I mean, he was very drawn to it. He saw it online, and, yeah, you know, I haven't done a deep dive into Crystal for a few years, but I never remember three, five years ago, ever hearing about this or right. seeing this stone. Right, it wasn't it around, like it, yeah. it, 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 like, appeared out mm, of nowhere. Um, Things have a way of appearing out of nowhere. So, what's been appearing? Now, you just got back from Tucson. I did. I was, I was, I was voyeuristically looking at your yes. social media. Oh, my. Yeah, you know, he did a little... Uh, Hey, I'm back after so many years of not going. It was 24 years since I was there last, which is crazy. Wow. And I managed to still do all the crystal things, buy crystals, stock up my store, do all that stuff uh, without stepping foot back in Tucson. However, hmm. going to Tucson is a lifetime experience. 
Um, it's not just one gem show like you sometimes experience in this area. It's actually 47 and counting. And each show is as big as a football field. Wow. So some of them are in tents, uh, like individual tents. Some of them are in huge tents. Some are in buildings. Some are in hotels. Some are in hotel rooms. Yeah. Um, and you plot out your course. You say, okay, where am I going today? And every morning I made a point first to get my head clear and get a little physical exercise to go out into the foothills around Tucson and enjoy the nature there. Mm -hmm. And then I would hit the shows from 10 till 6 or 7. And uh, it was a joy from start to finish. I saw thousands and thousands of mm. stones. Mm. Yeah, I've done Tucson a few times because mm -hmm. I lived in Phoenix for five and a half years. Okay. So I did Tucson once before I ever moved to Phoenix. And mm. I think I did Tucson like three times when I lived in Phoenix. Went down and mm. would do the show. And I could only, I, it was like one day. It was like one day, I'm done, I'm gone. Yeah. But they'll have crystals and they'll have, they'll have crystal sculptures. They have... There's, there's this one whole big tent that is all phallic sculptures made out of crystals. I didn't notice that one. Really? No. So they, 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 they were actually, they had one that was taller than I was that was carved out of a crystal. I mean, wow. it was like $25,000. I can't remember now. But there was one tent. And, of course, they have a phallic festival in Japan every year. Yes, I've heard about that. And so... There or is, is it Korea, maybe? No, or it's both. Japan. Well, it could be Korea. Could I know it's. Both. I know there's one in Japan. There yeah, may yeah. be one in Korea, but I thought. But I found it very interesting because you went in and you would have these life. Well, bigger than life size, <laughs> <laughs> huge crystals. You know that you'd be looking at them and be like, "Who has that kind?" I call it more money than cents. Mm, you know, right, that's a good right. way of phrasing it. So, how long do you know how long that show's been going on? Because you um, said you haven't been there for 24 years. I want to believe that it started in the 50s, maybe the 60s, and it's been going on for that long. And it started very small, and some of the original shows still exist. Mm. Um, and some of the venues are in total disrepair because the rest of the year, it turns out, Tucson is not a very happening place. Ah. We did discover a downtown area. There's theater, there's art, um, and, you know, multi-story buildings, which I didn't think was a thing out there. Huh. Uh, mostly everything is just flat and one yeah. level. Yeah. Um, but there's some real rough neighborhoods there, you can tell. And I even met a dealer there who was moving because he was tired of drive-by shootings, not the type that happened on your radio oh, show. Oh, right, 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 yes. So. <laughs> well, they have the university. They have a, they have a yes, university Yes, and it's there. very well respected, I understand. Yes. Yeah, they have the university there, so that's an interesting... So they have that dichotomy of probably the insular college town university, and then it kind of... Stops. Yeah, it stops, and then you have the neighborhoods that you might not want to live in or go to. Right. But there are a lot of people that don't want to live in. I mean, I love living in university towns because yeah. they're always so full of like energy and right. culture and right. stuff. But there are some people that you know don't want to live in university towns because you're also putting up with frats and drunken, you know, drunken debauchery right. things right. and stuff right. like and then that. Then you have to go and yell things like "Get off my lawn" because you've got drunk college kids on your lawn. Exactly. Nobody so wants to do it. that. That's no, true. yeah. See, and I would never yell at him to get off my lawn. I'd just go see if they had a credit card so I could charge him rental space. Uh -huh. uh <laughs> or ask him if they want a blanket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's just nice. Yeah. That's a nice gesture. <laughs> nice gesture. Yeah. So what was your so, most exciting find in Tucson? I'm just curious. Did you I have a really you, exciting find? I did. Um, well, I had a friend, another buyer, who was texting me, and he said, and she said, actually, all the... Brazilian buyers have this thing. You'll know it when you see it. And I went to a couple of shows, and I'm like, I'm not getting it. What is it you're talking about? She said, it's a certain shape, a certain form. And I'm like, look, put me out of my misery. Tell me what you're talking about. And uh, I found out that, in fact, what it was, and then some of the later shows I went to, it was everywhere, was a brand new find out of Brazil. It's an amethyst variety that's found in a part of the country that's mostly known for clear quartz. 
and they found a huge amethyst uh, vein. Mm. And this amethyst grows, it, first of all, it, it fans out. So it has a, shall, a narrow root and then it grows out like this. Ooh. And then it's filled with points and tons of what they call uh, cathedraling or record keepers. So these little triangular uh, faces, facets, all over the whole thing. Incredible, like a, almost like a pineapple. It's very, very uh, rich, textured, awesome stuff. I only ended up buying one piece of it because it was pretty expensive mm. and most of the pieces were like big and you know, multi hundred dollar pieces or thousand yeah. dollar pieces. Um, but I got one about that size of this wolf here, uh, stands up and has all that um, incredible cathedraling on it. And I loved it, um, but that's not the main, the main thing I found myself looking for, seeking and buying. I was really into three main stones. One of them, which you do not find out here on the East Coast much at all, was jade, case in point. Mm. Okay, this is a river-worn Wyoming jade that I've actually had for 30 years myself. Check it out. Yeah. It's super soft and all, they call it a slick, I learned when talking to the jade people. And um, I was very excited because there was a fair amount of jade if you knew where to look. Mm. Um, and I got a bunch of it. Yeah, it's on the way here in a, on a pallet because I had to figure out how to get it transported here. Yeah. So I got jade and then I got sujolite, which is another big favorite of mine. It's a purple stone. I almost wore my ring, but... It's been a hectic day because in addition to doing all the things that I have to do since coming back, I'm celebrating my birthday today. Oh, today's Boom. your birthday. Today indeed. Oh, happy well, birthday. happy birthday. Thank you very much. It so, looks like a person on here, by the way. I'll see. The guys, it does, wait, show me the face, the nose, the eyes. The, the, the head. Yeah. And the torso. Okay. I, I don't know oh, what yeah, I yeah, at yeah. I, just, I see what you're saying now. Do, do you see it? It's almost like one of those medical diagrams that shows all the lungs yeah, and everything. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the so first thing I thought when I looked at it, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's um, not really a face, like it's a, a bust. person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bust. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, that's a favorite, and I learned, uh, I, was, I was instructed by one of the wise jade masters never to sell that because it's worth a whole lot and not something you would come across very easily. Wow. So that was really fun. And then the third type of stone, and all of them have a, an energetic meaning. So this jade is a heart stone, and the sujolite is a sort of mind and spirit stone. It's rich purple, kind of like these uh, curtains. And the third stone is a body stone. It's called rhodochrosite. It's really rich, and it comes from Argentina. It's red and very flowing and biological looking also mm. in a kind of a way. So you got a, uh, a kind of a, a grounding foundation stone, the yep. Rotocrosite. Yeah. A heart stone, the jade. Yep. Um, now, the, uh, and then you kind of got a third eye. The upper sujolite so is like yeah. a spiritual manifestation stone. Yeah. So amethyst is like a spirit mission stone. It's a way that you can sort of tune into what your spirit mission is. In your case, it's uh, stirring up the political pot. Yes. Um, and also basically sharing different creative content with the world. And so for me, my spiritual mission is sharing what I know about the crystals and creating community in the process of doing that. Um, and so the difference between an amethyst and a sujolite is the sujolite is more about making it real, making it happen, getting the job done. Uh, it's not just a sort of pie in the sky or a vision that you're having. It's, it's putting the nuts and bolts together mm. to make it happen. So amethyst is, uh, so an, an amethyst, well, actually, I would look at probably an opalite as being the top story of the three-story universe with Plato, the amethyst being the second and the sujolite being the third. Are you, are, you, are, are you familiar with the Plato three-story universe? I am universe? not. Tell me. Yeah, yeah. Um, a concept always fascinated me. Plato came up with the three-story universe, which says that um, you, have, you have everything that is. Right. Then you have the ability to tap into it, and then, you, and then is the manifestation. Mm. So 
um, the manifestation is always the least perfect. Mm. And then the vision is the second least perfect. Right. And then everything that is, which is more so than we can ever comprehend. Right. So that everything, so before anybody could, could build the table, they had to create a table in their mind, but the concept of table existed before they even tried to visualize it, and that was the higher. Right. So that's why I said, so amethyst is like the second, and like right. sugilite is your third. It's, okay, here's the table. Well, I have a visual that I think explains what you're talking about really helpfully. Consider the top tier that you were talking about being like the sun, the middle tier being like a lens on a magnifying glass. And then what gets created is what's reflected through that magnifying glass, whether it sets something on fire or doesn't. Mm. Um, and that's how those three tiers kind of happen. Yeah. Now, you said that you had three particular... Now, is there something energetic going on in the world? Was there some kind of message or mission that made you feel like, these are really my three mm. points? What was the driving force to decide? Because I, I love all three of those stones, very familiar with all of them, um, have all of them, some form of all, uh, of all of them. Right. Um, what, is the, what, was the, what was the driving force for those three stones? I think that one of the things that ties them all together is that, in a sense, they are dying breeds. They're not unlimited in quantity. They are more rare, more expensive, and more energetically uh, powerful than a lot of other stuff. And so for me, it was feeling like I'm at Tucson after all these years. I need to take advantage of this because in five years, you won't be able to find this or you won't be able to find that. Mm. Uh, for example, in South Africa, where the sugilite comes from, and by the way, for purists, I will tell you that it's pronounced Sugi Light because it's named after a Japanese guy, not the founder of your festival that you mentioned, uh, but his name was Sugi. Mm. Um, and so it, technically it's supposed to be Sugi Light, but most of us call it Sugilite. What you want to try to avoid is calling it Sugar Light or Sugar Light or Sugar Light or something. And people make all kinds of uh, interesting errors with it. <laughs> but in South Africa, some of these mines are actually cemented closed because nobody wants them to be... Uh, exploited. Really? Uh, yeah, because they want to keep the value up high or also because it's mixed with uh, manganese, which is an industrially relevant stone, and they'll go in and destroy the good stuff to get to the better stuff because okay. it has industrial uses. In Argentina, it's the same thing. The mountains that have rhodochrosite also have gold. So they're like, who cares about this stuff? We're going for the gold. Uh. Um, so I, I'm very lucky and pleased to have found what I did. So I got incredible that stuff in those categories, but you can't help but stumbling across meteorites. I got amber. I found a Russian chrysocolla. I found pieces that you wouldn't norm some carvings, some great carvings, Ganeshas in all different great materials. Um, so I put together, oh, and lamps, these internal lighting lamps. So there's mm. a light bulb inside and a big stone shell, and it makes a very warm sort of indirect light. You can put it in your living room, and it's almost like having a fireplace there. I've noticed that there's been an, uh, somewhat of an increase because, uh, you know, originally it was all the, the salt lamps, the Himalayan salt lamps. Right. But then... Um, Jeff actually had one that was that was a, had a selenite, yeah, and the bulb was in it. Yes. Um, and now I've seen a couple of rose quartz that were that was done with. Um, but it seems like that that people have gone from the salt lamp, which had all of these healing properties, mm. to now creating uh, decorative. And of course, each of the crystals have their own energy. Do you think? or uh, um, that I know what the salt lamp does, but let's say, do you think that there is any kind of palpable change between what the stone does at, in of itself versus if this stone is carved out and a light is put in and the light goes through it? Does it change or oh. magnify or shift Interesting the energy? Yeah. Well, would, would you hazard a guess on that? I would think it would have an effect. 
I think that's true. I think it can't help but do something because what it's doing is taking, it's, it's using the stone as a filter through which to deliver light. So yeah. you're getting light, but you're getting light through this filter of the stone energy. So it almost is an added value rather than just having the stone. That makes sense. Um, so I think I would, I would vote for the, for the lamps being useful in that way. Of course, you can't put them in your hands once they're a lamp, but uh, I suppose you could put your hands around them or <laughs> <Right>. something. <laughs> um, and they're sort of background, and yes, they are decorative, but I think they just they add an extra something, just like the salt lamps did. Um, I didn't see as many salt lamps as I expected to. There's some things that I didn't see. I didn't see hardly any palm pieces. Uh, I didn't see much of a metaphysical presence there. I did mm -hmm. visit uh, Robert Simmons's Heaven and Earth. Uh, he had a whole room devoted to his world. Um, and I ran into some other people and I made some great new friends and I've got a stack of contacts to follow up with and it's yeah. going to be a great year coming up. So next time we talk, there'll be even more things to report. Yeah. Well, I am, um, I would think, I'm just going to go back for a second to the whole lamp thing. Yeah. I would think that first of all, by continually keeping the stone warm, that you are probably going to shift the properties of it somehow. Hmm. In some cases, depending on what that stone is, it may make them more intense, hmm. or it could dissipate them to some degree. Right. Um, I, I, and the other thing is, is that some of these stones, depending on their color, could add a more of a, a therapeutic color therapy level. Correct. Totally. So um, what would be interesting, because I, I think if I was at Tucson or I had a bunch of these, I'd be like, no, no, yes, no, no, yes, no, no, yes. Like, right. okay, that's just you trying to figure out something to do. You had a stone and you decided maybe you could sell it if you stuck a light in it. Right, Because right. it doesn't feel correct. Mm. This one feels like this is going to give you something. Right. Although there's a lot of great ones. There were so many great we could we bought 5 of them. We could have bought 25. What of kind them. of stones did you did you get? All the ones we got actually are onyx. So onyx is just it's it's famous for being soft and easy to cut and um, it also has a variety of different colors. Sometimes you have black bands, sometimes you have clear, sometimes it's smooth, sometimes it's really rough and there's almost like holes in it. Uh, so it has a lot of personality visually. Um, I think the most powerful stones are not, I mean, I wouldn't say no to a jade lamp, but the most powerful stones are generally not turned into lamps. Mm. So the ones that are turned into lamps are soft and easy to work with, easy to cut, easy to have big. Um, and the most powerful stones are, like jade, for example, very hard to cut. Rhodochrosite, very uh, volatile. It cracks and breaks very easily. Um, so some of these other stones would not lend themselves to being made into uh, that type of an application. So when you say soft, because people obviously don't, people don't think of a stone as being soft. Right. You just mean that it, it's easy to cut it? Correct. Okay. Like from the cutter's perspective, um, in fact, the jade guys were joking and they said, how do you tell if it's jade if you, if you throw it and it dents whatever it hits? Okay. Because <laughs> it's that hard. It's like yeah. metal. Oh. And in the early days before they figured out they could use metal for tools, they would chip jade and use it because it was so damn hard okay. and reliable as a surface. They used to use it as spear points in some of the central South America. Could oh, really? be, yeah, because it was hard. But one of the guys showed me, he said, you know, I can't prove it, but I really believe that this was an Indian scraper for scraping hides. Uh. Yeah, uh. they used, they, they would have, uh, they used obsidian. I obsidian believe. is a great one too, because it's super sharp. They used obsidian, but there also was, um, I don't know why I have this piece of information in my head, but they would use uh, they they would use jade in like ceremonial ritual knives and blades and stuff like right. that as one of the stones that they well, used. Well, the Maori in New Zealand are it's almost like a religious thing for them. In fact, I learned that it's almost uh, disrespectful or illegal 
for people to take uh, that type of jade out of the country. Oh, really? Especially if it's carved or whatever. Um, so that it, they said that it starts uh, with a utilitarian approach, and then people, once they handle it, realize that it has properties, and then they start to respect it, and it starts oh. to take on a... And that the Chinese apparently didn't really know about or care about jade until someone brought the emperor this stuff and he's like holy cow this is the best thing this is going to be our national stone and everything changed from there oh, wow <laughs> now, was that the emperor that had no clothes <laughs> <laughs> that was the emperor that started that festival you were talking yeah. about <laughs> um now since you've last sat in that chair yes um you decided to do brick and mortar um, and now have a location before you just did stuff at either shows. With, at shows or occasionally with somebody it's at somebody else's place or whatever. Right. Um, this is a time where a lot of people say that brick and mortar is becoming passe. So I'm very interested in now your brick and mortar is in what city? Arlington, Mass, just north of Boston. Arlington. Okay. So. Um, why would the why the decision for the brick and mortar? Like why now and <laughs> take it from there. Take it yeah. from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, about literally this time a year ago, um, I started to have dreams about having a store, mm. and so I was like walking into places, looking at places, imagining parking this, like doing all this logistical stuff in my head which I wasn't really thinking about in my conscious world, but these dreams were just recurrent. Yeah. And I go through different, what I call them, I call uh, some of your dreams pass through what I call weather systems. And they're here for a while and then they go yeah. and then something else comes in. Um, and I'm grateful because before that, during the election year, I was having all sorts of... Uh, Nightmares world, of a comb over? Well, world oh. destruction, <laughs> right, actually. Right. Huge floods, <laughs> fires, explosions, all kinds of bad stuff like that. Um, but yeah. this dream started to come to me, and I had actually been a renter, and I was doing monthly open houses also in Arlington. And I started looking at places, and this one didn't work for this reason or for that reason. And then I was like, you know what? I should tell my landlord about this and say, look, you know, just so you know, I'm looking... In case you hear of anything, I'd rather keep it in-house. Mm -hmm. If it's something that's going to be, I'd rather you be a part of it, too. Well, he called me five days later and said, oh, guess what? The place right around the corner is opening up. So without even having to list it mm. or do anything, he was able to pass it right over to me, wow. give me a sweet enough deal to keep my old space, and then suddenly I doubled my square footage. I have a space that has a very decent-sized... Um, you know, certainly even larger than this main section uh, for the crystals. It's nice and airy, it's breezy. We did tons of renovations. We did two and a half months of renovations, putting uh, flooring down, all LED lights, um, replastering, lots of steps were taken to make it a bright, airy, uh, fresh place to be, not yeah. a sort of closed in, uh, dark, dank, crowded type of space. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that came out as a real benefit was that towards the back of the store, we have a three-walled second room, which we use as an art exhibit. So we have artists representing their work there, and we can use it for classes at the mm. same time. So you can have a meditation there. I mean, we have a host of events that we're putting on there. From None of which I've ever been invited to participate oh, in. Oh, really? Uh, just, oh. I'm just putting that out there. Oh, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I thought it would be too far to drive, but now I stand yeah. corrected. He thought it would be too far to drive. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Dig yourself deeper, Kyle. Um, he didn't yeah. Want to, he didn't want to put you out. Well, it sounds like you're interested, and that's the good news. Uh, we'll have to talk. We'll have we'll, to we'll, talk. We'll never know what I'm interested in. Um, but we've, got, we've had Reiki clinics there. We have had, um, what's that, uh, Tong Ren? We've got, uh, uh, that's a, uh, are you familiar with that? It's a, I've heard of Tong Ren, but I could It's a pretty obscure thing, but yeah. we won't need to take time to do that. You can look it up on your Wikipedia. Um, what else? Um, I'm leading all kinds of events there. I've got a meditation series I'm doing. I've got a workshop series. I've done retreats there. And I'm doing my Tucson to Boston 
showcase of all the treasures I've brought back oh. from the big show, which is not even arguably, it's hands down the biggest show in the world. There's nothing wow. like it. Yeah, Tucson is huge. It's uh, huge. Pe people go to a crystal show around here, and, 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 I'm, and I got spoiled in Tucson. I'm like, this is the this is a crystal show. <laughs> exactly. Where are the crystals? Wow. Exactly. Where's the rest of them? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it's unlimited and huge. But doing the store was a great move. And you, going back to your point about, you know, is everything online? One of the things when people started looking online is that people said is, I want to feel the energy of the crystal. I have to see it and I have to feel it. And I've noticed that with jade, too. You can't really pick out from photos. Often photos will play with the color. And the suja light is a disaster trying to buy online because they'll always show it wet. And when you show something wet, you're pretending that it's, you know, you're trying to give people an idea. What will this look like if it's cut into jewelry, if it's polished? Oh, OK. That's why they show it wet, physically wet with water. Yeah. Um, I always show my stuff in a wet photo and a dry photo because the dry photo shows you what it really looks like. And to me, if it's got great color when it's dry, you don't even have to worry about it wet. So is that why when they do the bathing suit issue of the Sports Illustrated, they're trying to say that these are girls, this is how they look if you wear them as jewelry? No, that's not why. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No. I'm going to let him handle that one, <laughs> which oh, he did. I've handled as much as I, that, no, that's not why, Dr. <laughs> no. Kevin, no. Oh, okay. No. I just, I, I, well, I just, you Got know, nothing I'm, to do with it. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. Um, so go ahead. I'm, so, <laughs> so, um, so I have found, and because I was actually building up my online business and doing pretty well with it in, on top of my uh, monthly open houses and the shows that I was doing out, and I was doing a lot of shows out. Yeah. In fact, last year I did four or five shows in New York City, which is a logistical nightmare, nightmare. that yeah, you can't even conceive of. I've done shows in New York City, yeah. Yeah, I just, I'm going to tell you just one thing, because I know that uh, up here in New Hampshire, it's hard to imagine this type of a scenario. But this show was in the Hotel Pennsylvania. And imagine that it has 10 elevator bays just for the people who are going to the 1,500 rooms in the building. Yeah. Then they have eight separate elevator bays for freight. And you're only allowed to load in and out through the freight elevators. Oh, yeah. So my wife went to go get the car, and I'm up on the 18th floor loading out rollers yeah. into the elevators. I put one in. I'm holding the door. I'm reaching back. Suddenly, the door closes oh, on the no. 18th floor with my stuff oh, wow. and my backpack with all the money that was made from the weekend. Oh, no. And I'm like, holy crap. Well, how is this situation going to get resolved? Oh. And it disappears. I have no idea where it's gone. I go down to the first floor. I go here. I'm just like... I got lucky, as lucky can be, because somehow it opened up on some floor where there was an employee, and they brought it back up to the 18th floor. Oh. And, but that oh was a close God. call. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, did oh. your wife go to Tucson? She did. In fact, she has always been sort of a backseat driver on this, like never really that into it. And she got into it. And now mm. she understands so much more, not only about the stones, but about the whole energy of what it takes to go from show to show to show. Because she was personally tasked with building out my earring and jewelry collection. So she had mm. a blast going through finding this, finding this, calling me, showing me pictures, take, come see this booth. And uh, together, we put together an insane selection. And mm. I went from having really a dozen earrings to now having a full selection of yeah. many, many dozens. So it was a good thing that she came along. Uh, we stayed with some good friends, so we didn't have to do the whole hotel thing. Yeah. Uh, but we did rent a car to you know, get around easily. There are these buses that connect all the different shows, but we never actually used them. Huh. Yeah, yeah. It is a pretty incredible thing. So I take it you're going to do less shows coming up now? Correct. Fewer shows. I'm picking and choosing. And the Web of Light is one of the few surviving shows that I believe in and want to be a part of and present for. Um, so that's a good thing. For which we thank you. Yes, I'm pleased. I'm pleased about that. And I also feel like it's important to be a sort of different type of uh, 
have a different type of offering. Because of my focus on some of the more intense power stones, oh, and don't even mention Moldavite, I just remembered. I've got the sickest Moldavite I have ever had there. Moldavite, for those Cold who might not flu. know. Huh? Yeah, right. It sounds, <laughs> sounds like, like something you need an antibiotic. Sounds like you, you <laughs> administer nasally. <laughs> um, the Moldavite. Moldavite. Uh, did it not come through the, the sky well? Did it pick up a cold in the upper atmosphere? Go ahead. I'm it sorry. is. Well, it is a meteoric stone. Uh, it doesn't come down ready-made. It's the result. It's a tektite. So tektites are basically e meteoric material that comes down smashes into the earth, blends with earth elements, and creates some new thing, ah. usually a kind of a volcanic glass. And most of the volcanic glass tektites are black and not translucent and can't be made into jewelry. Moldavite is green, and it can be made into jewelry, and it's gorgeous and also very interesting to look at. It's very uh, pockmarked, very sort of fissured, like it's etched, mm. like it's acid washed, like very sophisticated surfacing on, on, the, on, the, on the face of it. Um, and some of them have more or less of that. But I found a few different dealers, bought some great pieces, bought some jewelry. I'd never bought jewelry made out of Moldavite because I never thought you could tell if it was real. I was like, how do you know this isn't just green glass that's been cut up and put in an earring? Mm. But the way they did this, they kept the natural facing on one side so that you could know that it was the real deal. Mm. Now, a lot of people comment that, that uh, Moldavite really like is too intense for them. It screws their energy up. I mean, I... I personally, I never give that much power to any crystal. Mm. There's just not a crystal that's out there that's any bigger or better than I am. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like you, you take what the crystal offers and you can leave behind what you don't. Right. Pe people don't get that, you know, you, you can you actually can create and should create and have a relationship with every crystal that's in your possession. Right. I'm with you and I agree with you on all of those points. However, it is possible to get a whopper that takes you out of your comfort zone. In fact, that's how I got into crystals in the first place, was that none other than Robert Sivens gave me a piece of Moldavite. And who, who is that, Robert he's Sivens? He's a guy who's written a bunch of books. He spearheaded the online selling of crystals early in the game okay. and has made a huge uh, career out of doing that. And he also leads workshops. I did a four-day retreat with him a couple of summers ago. Some people love his work, some people don't. Um, but the bottom line for me is that the Moldavite he gave me was in itself transformative. Mm. I had all sorts of crazy visions from it and then I came out of it knowing much, I can't say exactly what percentage, but a good percentage of what I know came through that Moldavite. Even though as soon as that happened, I eschewed it. I said, I can't touch Moldavite or be around it. And I wasn't around it for 20 years. Mm. Uh, but it delivered the goods, and I was very grateful for that. Can you be around it now? I can. I can. I love it now, uh, although I haven't met as much of a whopper as the one that I met first. Um, you know, it's like sometimes relationships. One relationship is like thunder and lightning, and the other is like, you know, a nice summer day. Yeah. <laughs> um, more easy to handle. And so in, in using weather as the descriptor, so how would you describe your relationship with your wife? Oh, my <laughs> wife is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I am not, not a, uh, both a pleasant sunny day and thunder and lightning. So she is going to see this is what you're saying. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, she will know. <laughs> she will know. I don't, I've never met your wife. Um, Though, uh, you know, she should, she should come up and, and, and support you in the booth one of the two days. Well, you know, she actually is more of a presenter in and of herself because she's a women's health coach and has fantastic mm. perspectives on women's experience of body and food. So she might actually do well in this chair. Mm. Well, well so, there, so three things here. One... She could probably do well if she decided she wanted to, to be at the Web of Light Expo herself True. doing what she's doing. Yep. Second, she might be somebody that if she decided to do that um, would present. Also a good point because she could speak for sure. Mm. And then um, certainly, you know, uh, send us a joint email. I will. And um, 
You, oh, you said you had artists at your... That yes. Research. So I am going to invite you to give any and all of your artists my contact information, give yes. my email, because I have the Dragons, Unicorns, and Other Creative Creatures show. Okay. Which is about supporting, promoting um, arts and the artists. Love it. So I do a weekly show, which is, I call it my heart show, mm. from as far as, you know, it's a, it's a heart project, right. to just get more recognition of people that are out there trying to make a living off their creativity. Mm. Yes. So we have authors, and we've had doll makers, and we've had glass blowers. I mean, mm -hmm. we do the whole, the whole parameters. But any of your artists, especially if they're local, yes. Um, have them get in touch with me because we're always looking for artists to be on that show. That's great. It's been a it's been a wonderful experience because we had that space to provide a home for because in certainly in that general area there is nothing like it. It's a really nice exhibit space. Three clean, good sized walls. You can put you know five or eight good sized paintings on each one of them and. Um, people can really see your stuff in a way that they can't back at your studio or in some cramped thing or in some shared exhibit. Um, so we've been happy. We've hosted three artists and we have a fourth one coming in now in the next couple of weeks. So certainly share the three you've had our contact and see if they want to come up and do the show and Happily. stuff like that. I, again, I, I really think that we don't get enough support for the arts in this country true uh, and it seems to be going in the wrong direction yeah. for it so it's my little give back to try to get stuff out for artists support. i'm wondering if matt if, if, if you've done a show about the cutting of funds to the arts because that is a political issue and it could be very interesting to get some artists on your show too to yeah talk that's about true that. yeah we haven't talked about that specifically no that is a good idea though yeah, yeah. you know so, yeah well, you could always come on to Dragons and Unicorns and you could do the political side and we could do the art side and right, could, you right. know, blow it out that way. Oh, yeah. So you do, do something on your radio show and then I'll do something on my TV show. And yeah, yeah. Again, uh, we need to get out. We need to get out there. Just like we need to get out more that, you know, people can use crystals for healing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it... Uh, a, well, I can't say there's no side effect. I mean, th there could be a side effect from a, from a crystal. If you drop it, you could break a toe, yes. uh, depending on the size and the way. You mm -hmm. could ban damage your budget by spending too much money. <laughs> there is that. Yes. That's a huge one. Yep, yep. Um, this is a, now you've talked about the, the jades and the sugi light. I like yeah. that, sugi light. Um, the the rotocrest uh, ro uh, rotocrosite rotocrosite yeah. the jade the sugi light this is a high anxiety time for a lot of people that still feel like this is a very chaotic unsettled time in this country right if somebody wanted to wear a calming crystal in a bag around their neck a bracelet a ring. What would be your top two or three choices of what mm, they should look good, for? Good question. The way I would frame that is to say that what you're looking for when you're seeking uh, to take it down a notch is something from primarily the throat chakra or the heart chakra or the belly. So belly is a body type of relaxation. Heart is an emotional type relaxation. And the voice is a sort of a, a word, word play, like taking down the number of words per second uh, that you go through your head. So I think it, I do often recommend New Jade, which is a much cheaper serpentine kind of facsimile of nephrite jade that is very soft. Yeah, so New Jade is a wonderful option. Another one is um, in the blues is a chrysocolla or angelite, which is also called anhydrite. And if you can find it, a lavender uh, fluorite is also very relaxing. Often comes in the shape of eggs. Um, and, um, and then orange calcite is a nice one for the body, the belly. 
So basically, the way I would present it is people have to think what part of them are they trying to chill out. And then based on that, they can pick the stone. Or you can lay out the stones, and then they can pick based on what they're drawn to. And then you explain, hey, this is about that, this is about that. And then they're like, okay, I get it. I, 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 I'd like this, but I really need this more. Mm -hmm. So um, um, you said something earlier, and I want to go back there. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, sure. But you referred to blue tiger's eye as also called being called hawk's eye. Yes. Now, is there, because I, I recently acquired a bunch of blue tiger's eye. Right. So I have like the traditional tiger's eye, the red tiger's eye, and the blue tiger's eye. Um, the blue tiger's eye, the hawk eye, um, how do we end up with these different names for stones, first of all? <laughs> like who um. called?